this might be repetitive, but my question is um, more about intermittent fasting. I decided for the beginning of the month, for the first three days, I wanted to do a fasting where I would only have like one large meal a day and um, for the first three days and then a plant-based, um, whole food plant-based. But what I'm doing in addition to water and well, I just heard you talk about herbal teas, like I'll do um, ginger teas or turmeric teas or those kind of things. But also I drink chicory, which I will put either um, organic soy milk in or almond milk. Are you saying that that's really technically not even fasting because I'm adding those things? Yeah, it's, to not, the it's not fasting, but it may be a helpful low calorie intervention for you. I have no problem with that. People can reduce their calories to 600, 750 calories uh, for a day or two. It may facilitate weight loss. They're, they're not going to get the physiological stresses associated with fasting because they're getting enough glucose to meet their, uh, their protein needs. You know, they're, they, they're not going to force the protein through gluconeogenesis to be mobilized. And so that's where intermittent fasting and a lot of protocols are out there. Walter Longo and others have different protocols. I'm not arguing against that. That's just not the same thing as fasting. It's a fasting mimicking effect. And the mimicking effect is that when you're in ketosis, there's a hunger blunting effect. That's how these high protein, high fat diets get people to temporarily lose weight is because they blunt the hunger with the fasting mimicking effect, but it's not fasting. And that's not necessarily a good long-term health uh, strategy. Um, actually fasting um, induces not just a hunger blunting effect, but all the other mechanisms that I've talked about today. So let's not assume that fasting mimicking is the same as fasting. They all may have okay. important roles. They may be beneficial. I got no problem with you doing what you're describing as a, a way of regulating calories and moving you in the right direction. Um, in fact, I'd rather see you do that than say water only and not get the rest and support that you actually need to do it safely. Very helpful, doctor. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna move back to Stephanie now. Hi, Stephanie. Hey, I just had a quick question. How do you feel about using um, electrolytes in the water to prevent dehydration during fasting? Like I've heard a lot of people say you need to put Celtic sea salt in your water when you fast so you don't dehydrate. Is that true? Do you also need to put cocaine in the water so that you don't get fatigued? No, I would argue against putting chemicals in the water, including Celtic sea salt or any other salt. It's very important when you're doing fasting to realize that when we're monitoring fasts, there are certain minerals that we can monitor like potassium and sodium. There's many things you won't be able to routinely monitor. What we've learned is that there are certain minerals, as long as those are the rate limiting nutrients, you avoid the, the dangers of depletion downstream. So it's important that we don't let our arrogance exceed our ignorance when we're doing fasting and say, well, potassium is low, so we'll just supplement potassium, and pretend that everything will be okay. That may not be okay at all, because now instead of potassium being a rate limiting nutrient that prevents you from getting depletion of things you're not able to monitor, you put yourself at risk. So we don't recommend adding salt during fasting or any other time. We want the sodium you get to be from the whole foods that you eat. You don't need to add salt to your food any more than you need to add sugar to your food. You need to add oil to your food. You get all the essential nutrients, the fatty acids, the protein, the sugars from a whole plant food SOS free diet. And, and fasting is no exception for that. Thanks very much for that. And now we've got. Uh, I just want to mention that the reason why people get dehydrated isn't because they lack Celtic sea salt. It's because they're too active or not drinking water. So if people are too active and they become depleted, that's a problem. And it's not going to be corrected because we put some salt in the water. Thanks for clarifying that. That's excellent. Um, now we're going to move on to Juliet. Hi, Juliet. Welcome. Hi. Um, I have Hashimoto. And is it safe for me to just not take my thyroid medication and just go on a fast? Well, it's interesting with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, this is an autoimmune disease. That means your immune system destroyed your thyroid. And, and many people with uh, uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis have what's called the HLA-DQ gene. And that's the same gene associated with gluten sensitivity. And the theory is that when people eat gluten, which is the protein found in wheat, rye, and barley, some people don't do well with it and they develop celiac disease. The immune system attacks their intestinal tract, very serious disease, and they know they have to not eat wheat. Well, some people's immune system doesn't attack their digestive system, but it attacks their thyroid. And that's called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. So the first thing we'd recommend is not eating wheat, rye, barley, or glutinous products for people that have that problem. And if you're fasting, it depends on 
if your thyroid replacement, how long you've been on thyroid replacement, if you've been on thyroid replacement for a while, it's likely that you'll always be on some level of replacement therapy. You may not completely normalize your thyroid function, even with fasting. And the protocol that we follow is we typically reduce thyroid dosing. We do testing, you know, pro proper thyroid panel. We reduce the dosing in half and fast people on half dose and then retest and determine whether the dose needs to go up or down, depending on how they respond. Some people, you can eliminate it. Some people, you can keep it on a reduced level. Some people have to go back to the level they were before fasting. The danger in fasting is that thyroid medications can be potentiated and may cause palpitations and other potential problems. So we don't wanna see that happen. On the other hand, if you just arbitrarily discontinue it, you may be fine for a little while because the stuff stays in your system for a while, but hypothyroidism isn't a very pleasant experience either. So we kind of balance that. But again, you want to be monitored properly with appropriate blood testing uh, before, after, and then on follow-up. So you definitely want to work with a doctor that's familiar with people getting well. Excellent. Thank you very much, Dr. Goldhammer. Um, we've now got a question coming in from Toya. Welcome. <laughs> Yes. Hi. So I'm doing um, plant-based as well, SOS-free. Um, what I want to know about the iodine, since I'm not doing the salt, um, I, I know a lot of people do the, like the dulce. Can I do the, the drops? Because I purchased the, the drops that I can just put in my water. Mm -hmm. Is so that enough? So first of all, if you get um, a, a food that's not just grown in the Midwest, where the soils tend to be iodine deficient, you know, uh, uh, natural foods generally have uh, decent iodine in them. If you want to supplement that with some sea vegetables, particularly kelp and, and, and dulse, which is very low in sodium, you know, you're like your nori sheets uh, uh, are another source of iodine. You can also supplement iodine. It's whether it's iodine drops or whether it's uh, iodine supplements. Um, for, for most people, they're going to maintain normal levels from a, a, a high vegetable content, you know, mixed diet. But certainly I wouldn't see any problem with supplementing with some kelp noodles or some nori sheets or some other things as a part of the diet. Just be careful that these sea vegetables also can be very high in sodium. So you don't want to get too carried away uh, with that. Um, they, yeah, so make, that they even make like kelp powders now that you can just sprinkle a little kelp on the uh, dried kelp on the salad. I think, I think that's what I was afraid of, how much I was putting on top. And I, that's why I thought maybe with the, sub, the drops, it would have the exact amount. So yeah. I don't want to get carried away with too much because I'm hearing different things about having a lot and, you know. Right, yeah, understood. And I agree, that's yeah. always a danger anytime you start supplementing things. But, you know, I think uh, two nori sheets, which is very low in sodium, less than 10 milligrams of sodium has, you know, equivalent of a day's worth of iodine in it. So, you know, it doesn't take very much of this stuff uh, in order to be able to meet your needs. And particularly remember that vegetables grown in soil that's not depleted in iodine generally have iodine levels. The only thing about iodine that's unique is that plants don't have to have it. And so they'll only have it if the soil has it. And so if you live in Minnesota and all of your food came from Minnesota, you wouldn't necessarily have enough iodine unless you fortify the soil with some uh, uh, seaweed and things of that nature. Thank you very, very much for that, Dr. Goldhammer. Uh, folks, we still have room for questions. So we're looking for more raised hands if you'd like to come in. I definitely got some questions for you now, if that's okay. Uh, actually, it looks like Toya has another quick follow-up. I'm sorry I lowered you too fast, Toya. Let's go ahead. I'm, and so, I'm so sorry. I just oh. wanted to ask about, I just wanted to ask about B12 as well. And also I started oh. this journey, Dr. Goldhammer, because of you just watching YouTube. So I'm very excited for that, you know, and just, and I'm, I'm pretty young. So I'm just happy to start this journey. Um, so B12 but, yeah, is really B12 important. Is yeah, very, very important question. I should have mentioned that it was my negligence. So there's only one nutrient that really is a problem long-term for vegans and that's B12. B12 only comes from bacteria. So people that are eating lots of meat are also getting a lot of bacterial exposure, not the least of which is from all the feces that's generally associated with meat consumption. So they're going to get a lot of bacterial contamination, a lot of B12. But people on a vegan diet, particularly those that wash and peel and are trying to avoid parasites and worms and other things by using good hygienic measures, will not get much bacterial contamination. And as a consequence, they will not get much B12. And over enough years, you can actually become depleted in B12 if you don't supplement it. We recommend a thousand micrograms of, of methylcobalamin a day. That's the amount of B12 that would fit on the head of a pin. It's a very small amount. There are companies like Pure Encapsulations that make a liquid version that you can use. You can get a vegan capsule from them, from methylcobalamin. 
And uh, lots of different companies make uh, vitamin B12. I would go with a, 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 you know, a known brand name just because quality uh, control is a little better. Occasionally, some of the stuff that's come in from China or some other places has, hasn't actually had anything in it. They're just selling capsules. But anyway, so uh, that is something we do recommend. A thousand micrograms a day will meet virtually everybody's needs, even people with digestive challenge and other problems orally. It generally doesn't have to be injected uh, because oral B12, even uh, dif- but with poor absorption, there's a diffusion of about 2%. So a thousand micrograms would get about 20 micrograms across the border. And that's 10 times the amount that's actually needed for minimal intake. So vitamin B12 is the one nutrient we recommend routine supplementation of. The other one that's common is D. You Normally you make plenty of D by getting out in the sun, but a lot of people are not out in the sun or they live so far north um, that they don't make sun most of the year. And so those individuals, if their blood levels suggest that their vitamin D level, if the 25 dehydroxy vitamin D is too low, then we would supplement that at the least amount necessary to get them normal. D unlike B12 is fat soluble, so you can get too much of it. B12, you're gonna end up making expensive urine if you take too much, but it's not gonna necessarily cause you um, uh, harm. (laughs) 